A piece of literature is remembered for its story, the beauty of its narration, the characterization, and then for the contents which give us images to memorize the tale. In this video, we will primarily learn about the symbols, then discuss the themes and the motives in the novel White Sargasso Sea. Symbols correlate the abstract meaning to a concrete form. It facilitates our understanding of the text. The major symbols in White Sargasso Sea are garden, fire, forest, the dead horse, dresses, and cocoa. The garden is where Antoinette seeks refuge during her time at Calibri. It shielded her from the harsh realities and also from the community that treated her as an outcast. She finds the place warm and beautiful. We can equate her garden to the Garden of Eden as well. Just like Adam and Eve, Antoinette's innocence also comes to an end as she steps out of the Calibri estate. Contrary to the garden, the Calibri estate symbolized the dilapidated existence of its inhabitants. The next major symbol in the novel is the fire. It is the ultimate destructive and redemptive force in the novel. It shapes Antoinette's life and we can find her fascinated with it for its beauty and power. Her first encounter with fire is at Calibri. It was an act of retribution and defiance on the part of the nearby slave community, but it destroys her life. The next mentioning of fire in the novel is after her marriage to Rochester. The fire of the candles in their honeymoon retreat draws up moths and beetles. Rochester seems to be so distressed by all these, but Antoinette accepts death as part of life. Her awareness and experience of it makes her accept the philosophy of loss and death. The last encounter with the fire is when she takes her flight down stairs with a lit up candle in her hands. There, the fire personifies her life and her sight and ultimately purges her of everything that weighed her down. The next symbol we have to discuss is the forest. The forest is where Antoinette finds herself in her dreams, walking in the company of a stranger to an unknown destination. Her fear of the unknown and the unfamiliar is what is symbolized by the forest. The dead horse. It symbolizes the fall of the white land-owning gentry in Jamaica. The Emancipation Act affected the slave masters and plunged them into poverty. Despite the truth, Annette often rode the horse every morning to keep up her name and by killing the horse, Annette's former servants signals to her that slavery has ended and that she can no longer occupy the lofty position in which she insists on holding herself. Dresses Though subtle, the reference to dresses and how their hair appears is a symbol of status and acceptance in the novel. Annette's attempt to reaffirm their state is marked by how she tries to make better dresses for her and Antoinette. The incident where Antoinette is forced to return home by Tia in her clothes is marked with humiliation. Later in her elder life too, Antoinette's choice of color is contrasted to that of Christophine and Amelia, thereby giving a hint to the difference in their characters and choices they make. The last symbol is that of the bird Coco and its pet parrot. It enacts Antoinette's own doom, with its wings clipped by Mr. Mason, notably an English man. The bird is shackled and maimed, mirroring Antoinette's own flightless dependency. The bird is narrated as making an effort to fly down, but his clipped wings failed him, and he fell screeching and burned to death. This passage presages Antoinette's fiery fall from the attic at the end of the novel. You remember she was called Bertha, right? And we are aware how name is integral to one's identity. The reason for Antoinette's suffering in her marriage, similar to that of her mother, is the next theme in the novel, the patriarchal tyranny. The subjection of women to male authority is vividly described here 
in which the men and Rochester in particular represents the patriarchal tyrants. They display deep-seated feelings of misogyny and turns deaf to the needs of women. They make decisions which proves to be fatal to all. Now let's move on to some general concerns addressed in the novel. The first is the corruptive power of money. Relations are formed and disrupted by this. It is a critical observation put forth by Russ through her novel. Another prominent theme is slavery and entrapment. We are introduced to a time when slaves are set free by British, but the Emancipation Act promised compensation, which was not granted to anybody, breeding hostility and resentment between servants and their white employers. It is the root cause of all unfortunate incidents that took place in Antoinette's life. Another aspect of slavery narrated in the novel is denoted by marriage. All marriages in the novel robs the person of their free will and enslaves them to their pitiable existence. The last theme to discuss is the complexity of racial identity. Subtleties of race and intricacies of Jamaica's social hierarchy play an important role in the development of the novel. Whites born in England are distinguished from the white Creoles, descendants of Europe, who have lived in the West Indies for one or more generations. Further complicating the social structure is the population of black ex-slaves who maintain their own kinds of stratification. This leads to alienation and a sense of not belonging to any place in Antoinette, which played a major role in her character formation as well. Now, motives and recurring ideas in a literary work which makes the reader realize a pattern and enables a better understanding. The first motive in the novel White Sagasusi is madness. It is the end of what the women characters in the novel attains. It is something they are accused of when they are totally sane and ultimately it becomes their reality. The life of Annette and Antoinette in the novel showcases this. Annette was forced into madness once her predictions came true. She sensed her future, the approaching tragedy which Mr. Mason addressed as exaggerations. When it comes to Antoinette, the scenario is much grimmer as Rochester totally believes others and live, never listens to what she had to tell him. Riss plainly yet powerfully renders what ignorance of the listener and sidelining of the speaker who wants to say the truth can do to the person. She renders it twice in the novel through the life of the mother and daughter to make the reader realize the need. The next motive is sickness. The portrayal of sickness is on two levels. The first is the physical illness like that of Fury, whose reason for being sick is unknown, or the sudden burst of fever endured by Rochester for whom it nearly becomes fatal. The second is psychological, the condition of madness endured by Antoinette and Annette. The former is caused by reasons unknown, probably an indication to how surroundings are vital for one's well-being. The latter is but the results of the suffocating conditions in which they exist. It is inflicted upon them. For both levels of sickness, no cure is written, but only a fatal escape is drawn. Death is a major motive in the novel, and it seems to hover over Antoinette's every moment. It is a fear of the unknown. Antoinette experiences the pangs of death from her early childhood. She first lost her father and then her brother and mother. One by one, she loses all of them, none to a natural death. She is too scared of that unknown force that even before losing her whole family, she uses a stick as a talisman to keep her safe. Antoinette is constantly afraid of death, yet she often mentions about it. This portrays how death and dying is not always natural in this novel. Sometimes it is inflicted by external forces, making life an ordeal for the living too hard to carry on with. Magic and incarnation is other motive in the novel. Magic is always used as a justification for things that can't be explained otherwise. In the novel, magic or incantation is the only force which begets the performer control over others. It is only through the inexplicable way people can have their deeds done. 
The practice of Obeya by Christophine is mentioned quite a few times in the novel which enables her to have her word be heard and followed. Magic is a means through which Riz empowers her characters even if it is only for a while. Lastly, when we study White Sagasso C, the dreams of Antoinette are of paramount significance. Her dreams symbolizes confusion, fear and unfamiliarity. Dreams are a key device used to foresee future events in the plot and give the audience insight into, into the character's concealed or unexpressed thoughts and emotions. Antoinette's dreams always appear confused and disorderly. This alludes to the mindset of Antoinette, who later is portrayed as a mad woman in Jane Eyre. Antoinette's dreams appear to leak into her waking life, which gives the novel an ephemeral quality. There are three dreams altogether in the novel, and each one marks the arrival of tragedy. The first dream takes place during her childhood, and she sees herself walking through a forest in the company of a stranger who appears to hate her particularly. There is an ambiguous narration here, and afterwards, the estate is burned down, and life takes an unexpected turn for her. The second dream takes place when she is 17 years old. Here, Antoinette illustrates a greater intelligence and awareness of the events as she describes walking through the forest at Calibri with a man who is black with hatred. She saw her wearing a white and beautiful long dress similar to a wedding dress. At the start, she tries to hold her dress up, trying to keep it away from getting dirty, but soon she allows it to trail it in the dirt, which makes or makes the dream prophesize her marriage. She also sees how they move out of the forest and goes into an enclosed garden, which she fails to recognize. It could signify either England itself or the room Rochester locks her in. The last dream she has in the novel is how she steals the key from Gracepool and explores the mansion on her own. Unlike the other dreams, she is the master here and succeeds in performing her free will. All the symbols, themes and motives adds to the intensity of the novel, making it a memorable experience so powerful and realistic that we at times can actually relate to Antoinette. By this, we have come to an end to the discussions on the novel White Sargasso Sea. I hope the experience had been wholesome to all of you and ignited in you a desire to know more. Keep knowing. Keep reading. It's the best road to travel. Thank you.